Sam Cedar on the Majority Report on the phone. It is a pleasure to welcome back to the program Elliot Spitzer, uh, who I, uh, I I actually saw last night in the uh, film The Untouchables, How the Obama Administration Protected Wall Street from Prosecutions on uh, PBS. We have a link to that film. You can watch it online. Uh, welcome back to the program, Elliot. Sam, always great to be chatting with you. Thank you for inviting me. So um, I'm not sure when you uh, you sat down with the makers of that film, but it, it really focused uh, specifically on the failure of the Obama administration to pursue any criminal charges against the top executives involved in the financial crisis, specifically the tremendous amount of well, I, you know, based upon the film, we're not supposed to say the word fraud, but um, mm -hmm. the, uh, I, the, the fraud that took place in the securitization of these mortgage product, uh, uh, products. Right. Um, and, of course, uh, today, or last night, I guess, uh, shortly following the airing of the film, uh, Lanny Brewer, or it was leaked, that he is uh, planning to leave the Obama administration. We don't have a timetable for this yet. But right. But yeah, I mean, you've seen the film. Just give me your sense. I mean, does it? Uh, did the film p properly go after? I mean, Lanny Brewer uh, was the focus of this film in, in many respects. Mm -hmm. He was the head of the criminal division. Just give me yep. your sense on on how uh, accurate you felt the film was, and if it if it if it was really uh, g getting the nub of what what the problem was here. I, I, I think it was a stupendous piece of uh, of television, and as I was sitting there watching it and uh, sitting there with my wife, and we had uh, our kids and a few of their friends there, I said, watch this. You can take many important lessons from this. I think that film, uh, what was on PBS Frontline uh, last night, as well as Inside Job, Charles Ferguson's brilliant movie about the entirety of the cataclysm, capture both the range of the conspiracy and the lack of prosecutorial response. And, you know, watching the Frontline piece, there's no question, Ted Kaufman was the hero and Lanny Brewer was the villain. You know, you know, Lanny Brewer, the prosecutor, who should have done much more, and yet who was always hemming, hong, hedging, articulating reasons not to act rather than to act. Now, you know, I've been a prosecutor. I've made tough decisions, and people will agree with some, disagree with some. So I, I hate to sort of paint with too broad a brush, but Lanny Brewer did not demonstrate the backbone over the past couple of years and the willingness to bring the charges, civil or criminal, against the entities that laid out the entirety of the massive fraud that was committed. And you're right, people are hesitant to use the word sometimes, but it was fraud. You read the stories and you say, yes, this was fraud. They knowingly marketed products that were bad. What, what, and, what, uh, it, it much more should have been done. What really struck me, and, and where I think that you can provide a tremendous amount of insight here, is that it is one thing, it seems to me, and Lenny Brewer, oh, time and time again, whether he was talking to the to the filmmaker, whether he was talking to uh, former Senator Ted Kaufman, who who filled in for, for two years for, for Joe Biden, essentially, and seemed to be the only, well, not maybe not the only, but certainly the most fervent uh, pursuer of, of 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 criminal investigations of what took place, what seemed to really what really struck me was that Lay Brewer was making the argument that we don't have enough, we don't have mm -hmm. enough uh, to to bring uh, charges. But w what was clear from that film, uh, more so than I think laid out in any way, that there was no investigation. I mean, there well, that's yeah, what that's really exactly was right. done. They, they, what they needed to do, and, and in in the documentary, there was reference over and over again to the Clayton documents. Clayton was the company that did due diligence for the banks. Clayton reported back to the banks that the loans that they were making were bad. The question, and I said this in the documentary, I said, the question then became, what did the banks do with that information? If they were told by their own due diligence company, these loans are bad and you're still securitizing them, and people up the chain knew that, did not react to it, they're committing fraud, or they're negligent. There are multiple layers of and many legal theories that could be used at that point to say what you did was wrong, stop it. And, and the, it does not appear that the just Justice Department ever tried to track that information. It is slow, it's hard work, it's laborious. As I said in the middle, film, you start at the bottom and work your way up. You follow the information trail. It doesn't seem that that was done. And as a consequence, uh, senior executives and uh, executives halfway up the chain were permitted to simply shrug their shoulders and say, oops, we made a mistake. And uh, that's not the way the system should have worked. From, from your perspective, as, as someone who was a, uh, a chief prosecutor, uh, not, not on a federal level, obviously, on a state level, but um, w w 
do you make that determination as to whether or not you're going to uh, seek an indictment, whether or not you're going to bring any type of charges prior to actually doing the investigation? I mean, that's what, what really st- stuck with me was that there was no attempt. I mean, we saw on in the film, you know, half a dozen uh, uh, whistleblowers there. Uh, now, of mm-hmm. course, uh, Bowden, who was uh, the uh, who was basically the internal um, uh, mechanism at uh, City uh, City Group for determining the value of those loans, and he was sending right. messages up up the uh, the the chain of command and, and getting no response, but. There, there did not seem to be even investigations to bring you to the point of saying whether or not we could prove this beyond a reasonable doubt. That's what I, I found so shocking, is that well, you can make that we, argument. We, right. oh, Good. We, we, we don't know with certainty the scope of their investigations, but I share your frustration. And I think what, what happened time and time again was that those who did the investigation, you had Ted Kaufman referring facts over to the Justice Department. You had Senator Levin referring facts over to the Justice Department. You had Phil Angelitas, who, who produced the FCIC, the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission document, which is a stupendous piece of work, referring facts over to the Justice Department. And time and time again, justice would then kind of wring its hands and say, oh, well, gee, we don't think we can make the case. And that is what has led to this enormous frustration that, that you're articulating, that I've articulated. Prosecutors whom I trust have, have, have said, yes, we are of the same view. You know, it, it, it appears that the – and then Lanny would always be quoted saying, well, we have to consider the collateral consequences. What would happen yeah. if we bring a case against a big bank and there would be shareholders who are innocent who are hurt? Well, that's true, but wait a minute. He's now beginning to get into such a murky territory. He's excusing the failure to ever bring a case. It's, it's the too big to fail, too big, too big to manage, too big to indict type of world that we're now living in, which doesn't bode well for the stability of our financial system. And what's stunning is that he made those comments that you're referring to, not in relation to the financial crisis per se, but into the case of uh, HSBC, which was right. found to have been laundering literally uh, uh, billions of dollars of drug money. I mean, so well, the, the, the failure to indict HSBC or senior individuals at HSBC about that money laundering is uh, a horrendous, horrendous error on the Justice Department's part. They've been excoriated in editorials across the board, New York Times in particular, really took them to task for this. And money laundering, again, it's, it, 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 there, if you're that big, suddenly you can launder hundreds of millions, billions of dollars of drug money, and nobody is held accountable. You pay a little bit of a fine, and then you move on. It is sending the wrong message, and it is, unfortunately, seems to be symptomatic of what Lanny was up to. Again, you know, look, Lanny, decent guy. I've known him for many years. I don't want to sort of attack him at a personal level, but boy, his judgments are certainly not ones that I think comport with what uh, ju- ju- judgments coming out of the Justice Department should have been. This is the Justice Department that w- was spending who knows how much FBI time, energy, money prosecuting Roger Clemens, right? And yet right. they couldn't find uh, a case to be brought against Wall Street. Right. I mean, not to mention, not not to mention uh, people like Aaron Swartz. Not to mention uh, uh, mm-hmm. whether you're talking about uh, IP, whether you're talking about whistleblowers, on and on and on. Exactly. Uh, but uh, now, one of the things that struck me in the film is that, um, short of a short uh, clip of uh, Attorney General Holder, his name seemed to never come up. And mm-hmm. uh, give me your sense of of what the likelihood is, is that Lanny Brewer had the ability, essentially, to stifle these investigations or to swallow walk them or to not even engage in them, uh, distinct from what his boss, uh, Attorney General Holder, would have, uh, would have ha- had anything to say in that regard. You know, I, I can't speak to the dynamic between Lanny and, and Attorney General Holder. I know that in, when I was Attorney General in the state of New York, and I had uh, individuals who were the heads of the major divisions. Any decision relating to a major case like that would be brought to me, and we would uh, discuss it, and we would make a, a decision. I guess ultimately I would make the decision as Attorney General. And so I'm hard-pressed to believe that Attorney General Holder doesn't weigh in on significant determinations of this order of magnitude. He should. You know, that is what the Attorney General is supposed to do, um, exercise management and also decision-making authority with respect to major structural decisions within the office, and these are those decisions. And so, again, we don't know. We don't know what Lanny and Eric 
spoke about, but I'm hard-pressed to believe that Eric Holder wasn't involved in many of these decisions. Do you think that it would have been, I mean, you know, again, this is the area of speculation, and <clears throat> and, and obviously you, you, you're not there, And but, I mean, is this something that um, that that would have started, do you think, with a just a general policy of, like, we can't do this, uh, versus uh, Lanny Brewer taking up you know, I mean, you know, again, from from what we saw in that film, and even from what he seemed to attest to, there was no. He made a very Lanny Brewer made a very poor argument that he had done any type of due diligence as to whether or not there was enough proof here to bring those cases. I mean, he was he was yep. asked point blank, "How come you didn't talk to any of these whistleblowers?" And uh, he basically said. I'm sure that we must have, <laughs> um, and th- which which seemed to be pretty weak sauce, uh, frankly. Well, it, it's also shocking to me that after being asked the question, he didn't have his folks at the department go back and validate, verify whether they did or didn't, and then get back to the producers of the movie and saying, here we did. On date X, we spoke to so-and-so. In other words, we did our due diligence, so they left it hanging out there with, with, with uncertainty, which is not good. I, I, I've said this repeatedly in the past. Whistleblowers are the critical link in making these cases. You need the inside voices. You rarely find those best inside voices by simply picking up the phone and cold calling into the bank saying, gee, tell us what's going on that's ugly and criminal. Somebody will bring it to you. You need to handle those whistleblowers with, with, with very carefully. You need to, to nurture them. That's how we the mutual fund cases uh, that, that re, re, to, re, led to tens of billions of dollars going back to consumers and changed that industry, all began with one whistleblower who walked into my office and said, here's what's going on. And th- that's how you make these cases. And, and, you know, I think sort of carrying on the theme of the film, one of the things that became clear is that uh, in the absence or maybe not necessarily because of the absence of, of any type of uh, federal prosecutions, we've seen... Uh, a a growing number of civil cases being brought by essentially the clients who were duped out of uh, buying these uh, crappy packages of securitized mortgages. Uh, the latest, uh, Jesse Eisen, uh, Eisender at uh, ProPublica has a story about uh, this large suit against Mar- Morgan Stanley, which is it seems to be sort of the the perfect example of what we were what we were watching in that film uh, that. Uh, exactly right. And it's, it's also a replay of what Goldman had done a couple of years ago in the Abacus cases, where they take bad debt, dump it into a CDO, and then market it without telling the, 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 the purchasers that somehow a determination has been made that this debt is not good. And uh, withholding that information is not the way the market's supposed to work. Betting against the very product you're, you're marketing is not good business practices. And the other thing that bothers me about the Justice Department is they've never sought remedies that will fix the problem. Simply having a big company pay a fine it doesn't do anything. What you need to do is have them change the way they're doing business. And that is within the ambit of a good prosecutor, within the ambit of the court. That is the creativity that they need to uh, use and exercise, and they haven't done it. And isn't the, isn't the issue of the fact that they, they were betting against these, uh, these tranches, the, uh, tranches of, uh, of securities, isn't the point that that is sort of uh, at least uh, uh, prima facie evidence that they knew these things were bad? I mean, yep. it, it, I mean it, that's the point, right? I mean, because they... they, they uh, it, it is, it is uh, again, it goes to the heart of the conflict that exists within too many of these entities where you're correct. They know they're marketing bad stuff, and they're, t- they, they're taking a short position not simply to hedge as they would have us believe, but because they believe they're fundamentally bad. And uh, when you market something and you're shorting it, it goes back to the same sorts of uh, duplicity that underlay what I call the analyst cases that we made back in 2002, which restructured all of Wall Street's analytical work, where they were selling stocks to the public knowing they were not, not good because they were getting the fees on the underwriting. I mean, that's the same sort of stuff that was going on here. And, and, and in terms of, uh, of a bank that knowingly... Um that knowingly m- issues these bad loans, and not just the services, but the, uh, you know, we, we heard from Bowden in the film uh, that at Citigroup they were looking at, he was looking at like a 60% <laughs> failure rate on these loans, right. uh, which, we, and he said this, this completely is in con- uh, contradiction to our own stated policies about what, um, uh, you know, w- what constitutes a good loan. 
Are there criminal liabilities for banks? I mean, because presumably these uh, loan uh, issuing standards are not simply just, you know, a business practice as much as it is also because they're federally insured in some instances, because the, the federal government uh, functions as a backstop. Are there, are there, are there criminal or, or civil, I mean, I, I, I presume there are civil uh, liabilities. Are there criminal liabilities if they knowingly break Absolutely. their own policies? Absolutely. I mean, because the policy, what they'd be doing would be misrepresenting to the public. And the moment you make a false statement like that, you have all sorts of possibilities in terms of remedies and liability. But again, this goes back to your, your, your Sam, your, your, your fundamental point, which is that Lanny certainly didn't give us the sense that the investigations had been done and the creative thinking had been brought to bear to figure out what could be done to stop either sanction what had happened or stop it prospectively. And that, that is what justice is supposed to do. And that's why I think there is the sense of outrage that permeated the, the documentary. Uh, there, uh, there was, there's, there's two other things I wanted to talk to you about. There was a story that, uh, that came out the other day. It didn't get much play, uh, but that um, a, uh, a member of the Federal Reserve, I think coming out of, maybe it was out of St. Louis, mm-hmm. um, has basically charged, or uh, it was Richmond Fed, it was Jeffrey Lacker, uh, about five years ago, I guess, or it was in August 2007, uh, he had an exchange, and we don't find out what the, 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 the Fed minutes don't get released for, for five years. Uh, he had an exchange with uh, then head of the New York Fed, Tim Geithner, uh, as to what the banks knew uh, as to the Fed's plans to cut rates. Uh, are you familiar with this story? I, I saw it, and I saw the interchange as reported uh, and the disagreement between the, the, you're right, the, somebody who was at the meeting and then what Tim Geithner said about his own statements and conversations with the bank chair. I think it was Ken Lewis at B of A. Um, obviously, Tim Geithner, who was then the president of the New York Fed, should not have been disclosing to anybody what was going to happen with discount rates or any other interest rate. Um, that's if basically that front-running, right? If signaled, then that would be a problem. That's, that's basically front-running, isn't it? I mean, this is the stuff... Well, you know, it would certainly give the bank the opportunity to adjust a thousand different things. Its portfolio, it could do a thousand different things with that information. That, that's market-sensitive information that nobody should have ahead of time. Tim, of, Tim Geithner, of course, denies that he communicated it, and so you have the factual disagreement there. I, I think what it goes to is the question whether Tim Geithner's relationship with the banks was closer than it should have been in terms of information flow um, and I've long felt that, you know, Tim, uh, again, will never challenge his integrity, his, his desire to do what he believed to be right. But I always thought he was uh, too willing to accept the bank's arguments with respect to both the structure of the banking system and also what led to the crisis of 08. But uh, here, this issue of whether or not he passed the information is, you know, a factual disagreement that maybe will or will not be uh, resolved down the road. Yeah, my guess would be not. <laughs> just, based upon, just based upon what we've seen. Uh, President Obama announced, uh, I guess it was uh, t- today, uh, will or will announce uh, today, that uh, he's planning to nominate Mary Jo White. She was a former U.S. Uh, attorney uh, for the Southern District of Manhattan, which dealt a lot with uh, Wall Street, to be yep. the, um, the head of the SEC. Give me your sense of, uh, of that appointment, if it, if it turns out to be the case. Good choice. Mary Jo is smart, tough, uh, knows the law, has run the U.S. Attorney's Office in the Southern District uh, during one of its uh, great periods of time. She's now a senior partner at Deborah Voice and Plimpton, which is a big uh, law firm here in the city. People will say, hasn't she represented some of the major institutions over the past couple of years? The answer is yes. But let me tell you, when it comes to Mary Jo, she is tough as nails, will do what is right, and I feel good about her, her moving into that position. Now, maybe too late to resuscitate the types of cases that we would have wanted to see brought after 2008. But having said that, Mary Jo is as good an appointment as you can get in, um, to head the SEC. I'm, I'm very, very happy about that point. What do you read into that? I mean, do you think to a certain extent there is a, uh, there's, been, uh, there's, a, there's a slight sort of change in perspective at, in the Obama administration? Or is this um, sort of, you know, like you say, a little bit, uh, maybe a little bit too little too late to really deal with the, 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 the real source of the problem, but this is sort of, I don't know, putting a, a, a Band-Aid on the wound a little bit late. Well, 
I don't, you know, I, I, I want to be a little kinder to them than to say Band-Aid on a wound. It, it, it may be a tourniquet, um, but it may be that the body's already beyond being resuscitated in terms of the cases that relate to 08. But, you know, I, I think they had a choice whether they were going to put somebody who was from Wall Street um, there were some names floated, good people, but they were from Wall Street, and uh, they would have perhaps brought a, a greater in-depth knowledge of how you know, some of those acronym-type investments functioned on the street and uh, might have helped in terms of drafting the regs the SEC has to, uh, uh, to, to push out the door. On the other hand, they went for a prosecutor, and I think that speaks to their desire and the public's desire to see cases brought. And I think that's good. So I'm, I'm, I think it is a slight shift away from pure regulator to prosecutor as the model. Mary Jo can be both and will be both, but I think it, it speaks well to their desire to, uh, to move the, the needle in, in the right direction. All right. So, so contemplating that sort of that, that, that mitigation on some level, uh, at least in terms of where they could have gone, I mean, do you think that there is a uh, – I mean, it, it, what, what's really sort of troublesome – in, in in many respects, to seeing something like that that film again has sort of opened up uh, old wounds for me, and maybe not that old. Uh, but right. is this there? There seems to have been just sort of a massive failure of you know. I look to to, to books like uh, Chris Hayes's Twilight of the Elites and it's sort of uh, that expanding the, the the nature of this conversation on some level. That mm-hmm. there is a, um, a, a a fundamental failure by our uh, uh, elites, whether they're financial elites or uh, governmental elites, to, um, to, to curb the excesses and to deal with, you know, the, the issues of accountability. Because to the extent that we saw, I mean, if you track from where you go from the savings and loans uh, through the, um, uh, the, the 87 problems we had with, uh, with uh, mortgages as well, um, you start to see a, a lack of accountability and a slow sort of degradation of the, the, the ethics and norms that are supposed to sort of guide these things. Yep. Well, look, I think that is the, the history of the past 20 years, and it, it is problematic. It is uh, uh, corrosive, and it has uh, touched many of our institutions, public and private, it is something that we have to try to push back against, and it, it speaks to a deeper issue way beyond Wall Street. But uh, I, I think uh, that, that's why the issue is one we have to think about it at a deeper level as well. I mean, what, what do you think, I mean, what, what, could, what can stem uh, this tide in some respects? I, I, I wish I had an easy answer. I, th- I think that to keep it to Wall Street for a minute, I think that prosecutions and civil cases, both civil and criminal cases, that actually restore some sense that accountability is part of our social infrastructure uh, would help. And that is what we should aspire to, and that's it's painful at times, but it, it is important. Is there any type of like, I mean, when, when you start to see these sort of, these, these specific uh, civil um, actions that are being taken by these clients uh, relative to the bank's um, uh, Supposed uh, uh, fraud or malfeasance in 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 repackaging stuff they knew was 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 crappy and uh, not just selling it but also uh, betting it against it. Um, is there any? I mean, wh- what the the one thing that w- cannot be addressed in those uh, in those type of actions is the broader implications of what happened. In other words, right. we, you know, certain clients may be able to be made whole or partially whole, but society as, as at large, uh, those people who lost their jobs, those people who lost their pensions, uh, those people who's uh, the cities that went, um, that had to make uh, budget cuts, uh, all as a result of this, there doesn't seem to be a remedy there. Well, that, that's, why, that's why justice needs to be more creative. I mean, the, you... You want to compensate those who are direct victims through financial uh, compensation, restitution. But what is more important is saying we will put in place a structural reform so this won't happen again. That still doesn't give somebody back a job that was lost. But at least it says prospectively we're not going to let you do this again because we're going to take the business model that led to it and change it. We're going to do something beyond simply say you made $5 billion in profits, we're going to fine you $1 billion, and you think, oh, that's not bad, I'm still coming out ahead, which is too often what happens right. when you, you look at the broader business structure and the fines and the fines in the context of, of how much money they're making. So what you have to do is change, use remedies that are more creative to stop the sort of behavior from occurring once again, once uh, things revert to the norm. 
Well, I don't know uh, uh, any sense of where that may come from. I mean, uh, you know, we, we've talked in the past about um, the, the state AGs. They seem to have, um, uh, Eric Schneiderman was part of this, um, the, I guess, uh, round two of a uh, financial uh, fraud uh, commission, which seems to have been, uh, has seems to have just almost in some respects melted away. I mean, maybe you know more than I do in that respect, but what... Well, look, they, they've made some cases. I think we have to wait and see. Hopefully there'll be more. Hopefully there'll be more. Yes. Well, all right. Uh, I hope there will be, and um, and I'd love to talk to you uh, again uh, when those happen. Uh, but I appreciate your, your talking to us today. Elliot Spitzer, Sam, thanks Sam, it's again. always a pleasure to be on the show with you. Thank you for inviting okay. me. Thanks again.